Today we are looking back at a long first year with the Panasonic EVO 1 and the reasons why one would choose EVO. We will go to work with EVO and discuss the strong and weak sides as well as the special abilities with some real life projects. We will see how versatile EVO can be rigged and used, give some fair criticism and make suggestions for improvements. And of course, we will speculate and write a wish list for the future EVO 2. That's a lot to go through, so lean back, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy our one year with the Panasonic EVA 1 review. Hello and welcome into the media division and today everything is about this little rascal, the EVA 1. And it's a bit of a special day for me, it's her first birthday because today, one year ago, I first laid my hand on her and I would like to tell you a bit about um, that trip and what it meant um, for my company and for my personal development as a DOP. If you don't own, own an EVA, um, maybe it will show you if it's worth it for you or not. So I would like to start uh, with um, why I chose the EVA 1 and what is so important for me about her. Um, I've been with Panasonic for quite a while, starting with the DVX100 uh, mini DV camera. That was the first camera to actually be able to shoot a 24 frames per, se per second progressive. From there, I went, like most of us, into the DSLR mirrorless realm because that was just the most efficient and cheapest way to get HD. Um, that was GH1. And from there, I really took off into the 4K realm with the GH4 and the GH5. And from there, I thought I wanted to step up my game as a filmmaker um, a lot. And the best and efficient way to do that is to become an owner operator. I was already producing um, ads, TV ads, cinema ads, uh, and special effects for um, uh, my production and other productions, but I was mostly the director and the producer for those. And we used mainly RED and ARRI cameras like it's normal on the RAM. And I have to admit, like, if I could afford it and if it made any sense for me, this probably would be an Alexa Mini. But um, as this can easily set you back a hundred thousand euros or more if you consider the whole package lenses, um, um, like everything that goes with it, um, I prefer to have a camera that I can own and that don't break the bank. And uh, EVA was the first camera that I had the feeling I can afford um, that deserves the name Cinecan. Of course, there were very interesting contenders at the time. Of course, we're talking about the Canon C200 and maybe the options from Kinefinity that had a very good bang for the buck, talking about the Kinefinity 6K and later the 4K. But I was not going under Super 35 for uh, this charge, so the 4K fell out. The Kinefinity had the problem at the moment, and they still do have a bit of the problem that they are not really reachable for the customers, and that their service is not quite there yet. And this is why I said for professional, Productions, you really have to trust your gear and Panasonic has a very good track record at that and this is where EVA again was the uh, tool of choice. Now Canon of course has the same reputation as Panasonic has but they choose not to include um, a, a good codec option for just your all day work. This is no 10 bit and um, that at a very low data rate so you have to go raw if you really want to use the capability of the cameras and as I'm already setting around like footage like about two to uh, four terabyte per month um, in form of ProRes HQ I didn't want to make this even worth with uh, something like the light codec plus of course the very expensive media that you have to invest in for this. This uses SD cards and that is great for um, situations where you just run for hours and hours and hours with a lower footprint. For example, for things like this. I am a GH4 and GH5 owner and I'm, I'm still putting those to use uh, a lot. Like for example, GH5 is filming me right now. And the um, EVA just intercuts very well. If you are used to VLOG L, uh, the VLOG that uh, the EVA produces just intercuts extremely well. You can just basically take the exact same lot and throw it on there and you have a great, great starting position. It is like a GH5 
that can do a little bit more than a GH5. Later, more about that. I really like the versatility of Eva. It, it makes a good figure if you uh, rig it up um, for narrative work like we have it right now. Uh, on a tripod, on, on, on event work like in a sports or music events when you have a very long lens on it and you have to really rely on her to shoot for hours and hours without any problems, uh, without running hot or um, being stable enough, be impressive enough for people not to just run over you because you, they think you're just uh, some amateur who's just doing it for himself. It makes a good figure uh, on a gimbal if you just use a pancake lens. You can even put it on a small gimbal like the Crane 2, which I think is a great thing. Um, it is very, very light if you rig it down. You can have it in one hand and um, be fine for it for hours and hours of, of work. I really appreciate that. The 150 megabit codec from Panasonic, 10-bit, uh, it's just great. Um, it's IQ-wise just as good as a ProRes HQ. I don't see any difference on a timeline or in an in a end product. Uh, I shoot more or less a ProRes HQ with the Shogun Inferno that I have on here right now. But that is more due to the fact that it's easier on my NLA and uh, it's just a way faster turnaround uh, not to do uh, proxies. That might change when I have a new system, if Apple finally releases a new Mac Pro um, and the uh, internal H.264 will work or perform just as well as ProRes. We'll see about that. Eva also delivers some very interesting slow motion uh, capabilities, uh, up to 240 frames per second. Um, in the beginning, before the um, firmware 2.0, 2 I was not too impressed with that because it was way too hard compressed for any professional use. But since the RAW out, um, actually EVA delivers ProRes RAW up to 240 frames per second in, a, in an amazing quality with some uh, quirks, but I will talk about that later a bit more. So the EVA 1 it was, and it is. And many people that come from a GH5 ask me, is it better than a GH5? And of course that completely depends. EVA is really not the cam that you put in a, in a car in a corner. Uh, it, it does have image stabilization but only electronic ones. So the GH5 has some very um, um, unique um, possibilities that it will give you that the EVA can't. If we are just talking about image and usability as a classic filmmaker considering setups like this, of course EVA is better and the image quality is um, significantly better if you are in a, in a difficult situation. I mean, if you just shoot a toilet in normal light, you won't be able to tell them apart. But if it really push comes to shove, if you're in, in lower light or if, if uh, the, the dynamic range is important, EVA is um, the camera to go. Uh, one grain of salt, most of the projects I shot in the last year were industrial events and I cannot show them here because they are, I am under um, non-disclosure. Um, but I shot some private stuff and I shot some projects I can show you here and let's talk about those. Some might remember the unboxing and the first steps films I published here and in the Facebook group. If you're not a member, please join. I put the link in the description. I was surprised how easy it was for me to grow into the system and to produce results I was happy with. Dual ISO was new to me when I first um, used it and I had some misconception about it and I heard it all over the internet that basically 2500 native ISO will give you a noise level that is comparable to 800. This is not the case. Um, 2500 native ISO has a significantly higher noise level than 800 has. And when I hear O oh, native ISO 2500, I would expect to be at least able to double that and still have an acceptable image. I don't think that EVA performs well under with 5000 ISO, really depending on the situation. Usually you pump up the ISO when you are in a low light situation and then EVA, even at 2500 ISO, um, being underexposed will um, not deliver a very good result. If you have some light in the scene and you just want to compensate, I say like for a higher frame rate or for a sl uh, slower f-stop, 
It works quite well, as you can see here. Here's an example I did with the orangutans, and you can see uh, that switching up to 2500 it does reduce the grain and um, a very, very pleasing result. I will go into a project later that is generally low key and where I think that a camera with a better ISO performance would have helped a lot. From there I was now confident enough to expand my work to something more public uh, with other people in evolved but still a um, private project like I did a, a concert for some friends of mine, a concert show where they let me film right on stage which is quite cool. And I was quite impressed with the um, ISO performance there. This is completely shot on 2005-0 under very difficult lighting uh, conditions. Um, there's a lot of dynamic range to cover for the camera here because you have this very strong uh, spotlights and on the other hand it's very dim light in the room in general. So this is a difficult task for a camera and I had a GH5 running to get the complete scene and um, uh, that just just failed. Um, it was mostly unusable, it was too grainy and Eva had a very nice and I think very cinematic look to it and I tried to make a bit of an unusual grade for this too. Um, the boys were happy with it. Um, uh, if you want to see the uh, whole clip I put a link up here. In the meantime I became a father, yay, with my lovely son Milo and of course Eva helped me a bit um, in capturing the more important parts of life. All these little private projects gave me enough confidence and know-how and knowing the weak points of Eva to be confident enough to take her out for uh, paid professional work and I did quite a bit since. Talking about the weak points before the low light, for example here are some scenes from um, a concept film I made for Mercedes-Benz and um, the exteriors of this car story we see here were shot by another team so I can't show the whole piece here but let's talk about the the interiors. I was going for an extreme low key look that is almost like painted. In real life most of the lights that you have at all in a, in a car would come from the outside and it would be dark inside the car and I wanted to have to, to maintain that, that atmosphere, not having an artificial, oh, I'm gonna light the whole thing up like you sometimes see in, in advertising, um, light the whole interior from the car up. Of course, you could have worked with more light than I did, but um, it would have been very hard to control the light spill and would have ruined this um, dreamy night look that I was going for. So we had very strong lights on the outside that basically uh, worked as my key light and some very small light sources inside the car uh, that I put into the dashboard and um, beside the actress um, to light the inside. And um, um, I think Eva was just good enough to capture this, but if you um, look uh, for fixed pattern noise and uh, stuff, you can actually see it. I would have liked a, another camera that has a bit better low light performance, a cleaner image uh, to work here and that has better details in the dark. But it's good to know that you can, if you have to, you can even push Eva here. Eva also made a quite good figure uh, on green screen jobs. Here the 5.7K down sample to 4K gives a very good detail that makes keying a breeze. Well, the brand color does help a lot too. Eva One uh, performed well, very well on the, on the usual stuff. Um, you have interviews, you have your tutorials, you have your little social clips. Uh, uh, whatever the company demands and one of the toughest jobs she was in was a three day straight shot that we did with two EVOS and two GH5 and I think every cam there had about of six to seven hours every day um, footage um, to record and EVA didn't fail me once and um, Right. There's a lot of stake in things like that and uh, mistakes are just unexcusable. Um, this is a situation where really, you really want to go with a cam like EVA and the codec is just perfect for that. 150 megabits, um, it is almost indistinguishable from, from ProRes RAW and um, it is uh, absolutely beauty to grade with 
and you don't have to settle for an 8-bit codec just because you don't want to shoot raw. Thumbs up here Panasonic. In most projects most people will of course mix a variety of cams and um, for most people that have an EVA the GH5 will be their B cam because they came from there or if they are coming coming from a professional, uh, more professional from the very cam, they might get a GH5 down. So it sits very nicely in the middle and you can just throw a lot on each of these three and you have a very good starting point to begin with. They're great very well together. Again, this is just a uh, perfect and easy to go with uh, environment from beginning to the end of a production. If you're interested in the production of the um, spot you just saw, I put another link up here. I made a whole making of. With the 2.0 firmware, um, Panasonic introduced the um, all intra codex 400 megabit, which I don't use at all because uh, it literally doesn't perform better in the NLA, nor does it give you a better image quality than the long gob in almost any situation that I ever put them through. And the cards are way more expensive. 150 works fine with simple V30 cards, um, never ever had a problem. The more interesting part about the firmware upgrade was the ability to shoot raw and record it. It was a bit, a bit of a um, um, difficult birth, let's call it that way. Um, first, um, only 4K crops could be recorded and uh, with the second update then um, the Shogun was able to record the full sensor um, as a ProRes RAW. You can record um, uh, 4K crops as a Cinema DNG2 and I did so for some private projects where I really wanted to check out and the uh, ProRes capabilities um, and the capabilities of the Cinema DNG RAW. Um, I'm not a Final Cut user at all and I, I have to admit I hate it. And uh, Apple will not make me a Final Cut user with their uh, tactic. I own the program and I use it to play out um, uh, some ProRes stuff from here. But it's, as long as Premiere and uh, Resolve doesn't support ProRes RAW, um, I think it's, it's futile. Um, ProRes or RAW will only work if those programs support it and then it might uh, just replace ProRes HQ as my main codec. Until then I will stay with ProRes HQ. In, in the final production I can't see much of a difference between a ProRes RAW HQ and uh, ProRes 5.7. Um, of course, it's only true if you're not talking about HDR and about relatively normal workflow. Um, RAW does have its advantages. What was the most interesting thing is that now the uh, slow motion that was too hard compressed could be exported to a RAW format and with, with a quite high bandwidth and um, that looks quite beautiful in ProRes RAW. And I experimented a lot for that. First in private you might have seen my little launch control video and um, I started using that on paid gigs as well. Um, there is a quirk with it and that is it produces some artifact that has something to do. I can only speculate here. I don't know what this artifact is but it, 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 it looks like it, the, the lines are doubled sometimes and it's an aliasing effect that is quite visible if you have uh, lines going through your picture. It, really depending on the, on the um, content of your picture, it can be totally okay to uh, atrocious. And um, just be warned um, that this is at the moment um, quite a, a fail because uh, a more demanding customer that you sold the ability to shoot pristine uh, 240 frames per second may throw that in your face or in the worst case even might refuse to pay you. The group and myself ha have made Panasonic um, aware of this and um, I think it's Panasonic or Atomos or both of them's turn now to say like is this fixable uh, and when will this be fixed. Which brings me to the next uh, part of this film. Um, um, I call constructive and fair criticism of the EVA. Um, I talk a lot about the positive things about her. Now let's talk about a bit of the things that in my daily use with her I think are her weak side. 
anyone who ever worked with even knows that the um, the LCD just doesn't cut it. This is why you will find that most people use this for navigation or for the home screen and have a secondary monitor or a EVF attached or like I do here have uh, a Shogun on it. Um, I know most Cinecams don't come with an LCD at all and it's just completely normal that you have to to buy one but you have to see it in the um, uh, with the competition and looking at cameras like the c200 or even the lower end gh5 if they have a monitor that is a better visibility and is more responsive to touch than um, this one is i have to say there's room for improvement the autofocus. Well, I'm personally not a guy who uses autofocus a lot. Um, I haven't used any autofocus that would work to my liking. Um, even if it hits focus like Canon does, it looks mostly unnatural. Uh, it pulls too fast or it pulls too slow and it never really knows what and to really go and tell a story and to pull in. Follow focus still rules the world and um, I like it. But of course for for example um, vlogging or for some things where you're not on the camera a working autofocus should be there and uh, it's a bit of a standard looking at the competition again. So this is really something that I would like Panasonic uh, to look into in the future. Um, not only for um, the um, EVA but also for the GH5 which I consider better but unusable as well. The low light capabilities are sub-ideal. I regularly don't, uh, I usually don't go over 2500 ISO and I have to say that is really borderline what you will need for event work where you're not able to design the lighting for a scene or for documentary or for wildlife usually you're not able to that and you need a bit more headroom for ISO so um, there's another improvement for a future incarnation of EVA. What I have to say I'm really missing a bit of um, anamorphic support which is quite unlike um, Panasonic because um, of course in the GH5 you have very nice uh, support for um, anamorphics and even using uh, 1.33 uh, times um, anamorphic lens like this one um, of course you get the picture but you don't have a de-squeeze without a dedicated monitor like the Shogun who will give you a de-squeeze so this works quite well but um, for 2x there is about nothing you can do and I would wish they would implement that into this camera and um, we're talking about the crop the 4k crop it should be possible to use a crop from the sensor that has the full height of the sensor and still, because it has less pixel than the full frame, deliver cinema DNG to uh, the Shogun. That would be just excellent if it would be possible to implement that into EVA. Um, I think you would have a lot of new friends with that. And here is one of my most important uh, points and um, wishes. This is directly for Panasonic. Please, 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 and put a little cherry on top of that and some sugar if you want to. Um, we need presets. Um, I can't tell you how many shots I missed because I don't have presets. Especially with the slow motions. Um, it, if you're filming like 25 frames per second like you would in, 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 in Germany, you have to change the system frequency. Then you have to activate the raw output then you have to change the uh, settings on uh, the uh, Atomos and by that you, you miss the shot and you have to go all the way back. I think it takes about a minute to get from one mode, uh, let's say 25 frames per second uh, 4K okay, ProRes HQ to ProRes RAW HQ on the Atomos slow motion with the ProRes RAW signal from the EVA. So let's try that. We are in 25 frames per second. Uh, everything is set up here with the Shogun. I'm recording ProRes HQ and this would be my normal shooting setup. And let's assume I'm not here 
uh, I'm remembering everything I want to do but I'm outside and um, I want to quickly film something that is probably fast because if you have a snail you won't need slow motion, right? So you want to change this fast. First of all you just need to know that 25 frames per second if you put that uh, if you leave it in that system the maximum frame rate is 200 but you want the 240 so we will have to change the frame rate on top of everything so let's stop the time how long it will take me to bring this into uh, slow motion first I will have to change the system settings and I have the system mode and go to frequency 24 and set. The camera will have to power cycle to actually change the system frequency. That eats up time. Now we're out of the menu again, we go back in. Now we would have to switch on the SDI RAW. We have to know that's the crop mix 2K that will allow the 2.5. There's a lot of things to remember here and a lot of in stress situations uh, um, Situations where you do something wrong and I'll tell you later what can go wrong on top of this and you exit this and now you can Actually press on here save very frame rate on and now you can go with up with a value You can do that over the none too responsive uh, touch screen or over the wheel of course and now we are on 24 240 frames per second. So that was easy, right? Not really. And we're not even done because as you can see here, it's still in ProRes HQ. And if you forgot to change that, you'd be in trouble now because it would record the high uh, frame rate, but with um, something like a Rec. 709. And um, you lose dynamic range. It's not what you want. So you, ha you have to remember to put this into ProRes RAW. And in a stressful situation, you're bound to forget that. And it happened to me before, and I was quite angry about that. So we have to change that to ProRes RAW, ProRes HQ. Okay. And this system has to power cycle too. Again, it's a lot of time you're going to lose. Now, stop the clock. This is actually how long it took to go to a high frame rate. And you will need exactly the same or more time to get back to your 25. This is not gonna fly and that's why we need presets. And not only for this, for everything else as well. For all the different crop sizes, for all the different raw modes and so on. And if it's possible, um, I don't know if that is possible, but it would be so cool, it would be able to trigger uh, with the presets in the camera, the recording mode of the Shogun 2. So let us be constructive and make some specific suggestions. This is the home screen of the EVO 1 as it looks today. Please pay attention to the upper row of the interface. We're adding a column with presets on the right and tapping or using the wheel will reveal presets that the user can define himself or herself. One operation would let us bypass all the operations we went through before in a blink of an eye forward and backwards, ideally triggering the recorder to change the setting as well. There has to be a way for the user to name the presets himself through the app, the interface, a text file or whatever. It's going to be very important because otherwise we're going to be lost immediately. Um, please, could you do that for us? Thank you. So let's go to EVA 2. I know this is just wild speculation and EVA 2 certainly is going to be down the road for quite a while. Um, but considering the development um, of the market and seeing what other cameras already have implemented, it is it, it, almost price range like that. Looking at the Kinefinity Mavo LF for example, LF and we all know it is gonna be the future. Panasonic themselves with the Panasonic S1 uh, and S1R, so the S system delivers a full frame for photography in the near future. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense, just like EVA is an extension, is a possible extension of the GH line, that EVA 2 would be a possible extension of the S 
system, which would mean a unified mount, the L mount, which makes a lot of sense. Of course, Panasonic should deliver an EF mount um, with that, um, where we are sure it is tested and all EF lenses that are supported are actually supported. Uh, no shenanigans there. But the L mount will allow you to very easily swip, swap, uh, swap to uh, PL mount and to uh, EF and to MF, whatever you, whatever you want. And it's a very interesting mount for the lenses that uh, Sigma and Leica and Panasonic themselves will uh, produce in the near future for a light hand-up setup. So, same is for the media. Um, RAW will be the big thing and um, I think EVA 2 has to support RAW in any of its uh, configurations. ProRes RAW is interesting if, like I said, Apple is willing to expand that to Premiere and Resolve and those take it. Otherwise Panasonic has to look for other uh, options but RAW is a must. And Panasonic themselves said they're going to support um, 8K until 2020. So if EVA 2 is the one uh, that supports 8K, um, the LF, LF sensor makes a lot of sense because um, I think we can all agree that more resolution only makes sense as long as you maintain um, the same sensor size because uh, if we just go smaller and smaller with sensor, our image qu quality will effectively drop and not get better. So this is just a downward spiral that we have to avoid. A larger sensor is the way out and we can see with the Alexa LF and the Kinefinity LF and LF, 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 um, it will come. Uh, EVA 2, certainly LF please and 8K probably and RAW, which means you have to use different media. And again, it makes sense to unify the media with the uh, System S which is XQD, which is competitive again with SD Express that would be capable of taking the, in the uh, data speed that you would have to expect going for a ProRes RAW 8K. So the LCD is something Panasonic has to change for the EVA 2. Um, I think a little bit larger would be nice. Of course, it would be nice to have a 1500 nits so we can use it without the dreadful hoodie that was on this one, it breaks immediately and um, uh, something that is better, more responsive to touch uh, that people with gorilla hands like me can still use it like I can the GH5 by the way, so it's not just my fingers. Um, something that you want to work with and I think Blackmagic shows quite impressively uh, how nice a screen can be in a camera. Give us good autofocus please. I would like to have a tether option like the GH5 has too that you can remotely control the EVA and um, of course you can it about the Wi-Fi but one of the things that makes it completely uh, senseless for me is that there's no image in the Wi-Fi signal. Um, that is something that has to be good because I would use it mainly to pull focus while I'm not on the camera and you can't do this. Um, GH5 is not bad um, I think that you can go way better with it. For example, uh, have um, focus options that um, support external wheels and um, that will allow you to really, really remotely pull focus using the servos of the lens and the camera. Um, just an idea. Uh, the 240 frames per second 2K. Um, nice thing to have, but I think it is uh, uh, as long as we have these artifacts, it's, it's not, a, not a selling point because you can't really, really sell it on a professional job. Um, clean that up, please. Uh, looking at the competition and taking the LF sensor in consideration, uh, it should be able, uh, possible to, for the EVA to, to produce a, a usable image at 10,000 ISO, as it looks and from the footage I saw so far from uh, the Kin Infinity uh, Mavo LF, um, it has no problems at 10,000 LF and is cleaner than the EVAS at 2,500. Maybe something to implement. Of course that would mean that we have a dual ISO again. How about something like 800 and 5,000? So that was it for today and if you are not a member of the um, 
Panasonic, AU, EVA, ONE, Facebook group, um, please consider that. Uh, I put a link in the description. And as you heard, uh, we have under the same direction, uh, a Panasonic S1 Lumix system group two on Facebook. And I put that link in the description too. If you're generally interested in the new mirrorless uh, full frame system of Panasonic, uh, please consider becoming a member of that group uh, too. And we will keep you up to date with everything we know. And we have a pretty good uh, um, direct relation with Panasonic because uh, one of the admins in both groups is uh, Bernard Bertrand who is a Panasonic Lumix ambassador. If you found this useful I would really appreciate if you give me a like and if you want to see more of this please don't forget to subscribe. 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 Thank you. I hope I see you next time and until then bye bye.